I'd like to call first on uh, Stephen Gift. And uh, it's certainly um, a wonderful opportunity to kind of explore the conditions that will occur as we move into the future of higher education. I think one of the things that I would like to um, kind of emphasize is that um, I think our campuses reflect um, in some way uh, the metaphor of intelligence. Um, you know, even in this conversation so far, um, you know, the diversity, um, the kind of dynamics and distinctness of universities needs to be appreciated. Um, Fredonia, Georgia Tech, and the University of Minnesota um, are dramatically um, different places, um, and they perform dramatically different roles in higher education. Um, there are similarities, but um, there is a, a kind of wonderful diversity at, at play here that, that I think we have to recognize. So as we um, approach the question of um, how has the campus changed, I think it's important to examine um, what the um, change dynamics have been, what has caused the change, um, so that we can understand that in the context of this diversity. Um, and I think central to that change has been the um, retreat of taxpayer support for higher education over the last 30 years. I think we all understand that, but it's not very much discussed in our culture as to what um, caused it and what the implications of it are. Um, it certainly slowed the pace um, of development on college and university campuses, um, and it's forced us to think in more integrated and um, collaborative ways about how the campus needs to grow and change, um, to be more sustainable um, and to um, think more in an integrated sense about how we plan our campuses. Um, and um, certainly as we look to the future, um, the pace of change is only going to um, accelerate. And I think this has been much explored this evening, but um, with the um, advent of things like um, robotics and simulation, virtual reality, um, and um, gaming, which, uh, you know, in, in a single word, I think um, gaming is going to reinvent um, higher education in really dramatic ways. Um, and the, um, the notion that um, gaming allows education to become embodied in a virtual space um, is really a powerful kind of thought about what the future of higher education is. Um, and I think Einstein said something um, long ago that is, um, I never teach. I provide the condition in which students can learn uh, becomes a guide to what the future of the campus might be. Um, and, and I think um, this embodied education notion um, is going to, forgive me, I'm looking at three or four different screens and one of them just started speaking to me. Um, this kind of notion of um, an embodied education um, will become both the virtual space and the physical space. Our campuses need to become uh, much more dynamic in the sense of being learning laboratories. Um, and places where exploration is the uh, business of the day. Um, and this, this exploration is the path then um, to the opportunity to learn. So that would be my um, kind of contribution is we need to understand why change is occurring and technology is often cited. But I think there's a much more um, dramatic cultural shift going on. Um, and, um, you know, technology will um, also lead us to this new future. Um, so it's a, it's a kind of fascinating conversation, um, but I'm struck by the um, kind of diversity of um, positions in the conversation even um, this evening. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, Gregory? The last comment is, is a perfect segue into what was, what's was what been going through my head as I've, I've had an opportunity to learn and listen tonight, um, in that the, the point that our campuses are very diverse is not one that I think that can easily be dismissed. And if, if you were to ask me from my perspective, for, for those of you who don't know me, I, um, I'm an evil consultant who spends a lot of time on a bunch of very different university campuses. Um, but if you were to ask me what was changing on those campuses, my, uh, my global answer, if any such thing exists, would be not, not very much. Uh, Many, many campuses are, are unfortunately not able to match a, a tech or a University of Minnesota in terms of change of pace. And um, 
And so they probably look very similar from a physical perspective to the way that they looked uh, 10, 15, 20, 50 years ago. Um, and that's, that's interesting. So, so what is changing is that the campuses are getting older. Uh, and that has enormous implications for many, many institutions um, who, who frankly don't have the resources to deal with an aging building stock that is completely out of sync with all of the absolutely 100% correct thinking that's been expressed tonight in terms of both active and engaged learning methodologies and in terms of moving a research platform from a discipline-based environment to a problem-based environment. Uh, I, those comments I couldn't agree with more wholeheartedly, but for the vast majority of our campuses, the physical infrastructure for that is, is, is not existent because it's, uh, it's, it's old and it's, it's falling down around most folks' ears. And given those circumstances, it's, it's very hard for many folks to imagine a, a very different future. And, and somebody said earlier tonight that might mean that colleges simply begin and universities simply begin to disappear. And, and I fear that that might be right. And, and, and what I fear the most then is this potential for stratification. And uh, technology for me is always more of an amplifier than it is a, a, a revolutionary. Um, and the effect that scares me is that those who have access to the social capital of our great institutions will become more and more successful. That, by the way, I think maybe is why people still go to physical places more than anything else, is to gain access to the social capital, uh, going back to an earlier point. Um, and those folks who don't have access to that um, risk becoming more and more marginalized, which is, which is a comment, again, that's been raised pre previously. So that, that's one bundle of thoughts that, that's been going through my head as I've listened to this um, fantastic conversation. The, the second significant change on the campus that I think is very important to recognize is that almost every campus has become very distracted from its core mission. Uh, you know, an institution like Tech or University of Minnesota, uh, I'll make up a number, but it'll be in the ballpark. You know, probably 3% of the space is classroom space. Um, and we've aggregated in facilities and aggregated in, in environment uh, in a way that isn't necessarily bad because I certainly recognize that the learning environment extends far beyond our sort of scheduled instructional spaces. Um, but there is, a, there is an accretion of facilities, you know, it's the climbing wall syndrome that, that dominates universities that, and colleges that frankly should know better. So in some sense, the, the, the dynamic in higher education is one where revolution is juxtaposed with ossification. Um, and the institutions that, to me, will be successful moving forward are ones that are able to address that tension and that dynamic. The academy, by its nature, is often not something that embraces new thinking because professors have spent an awful long time establishing their reputations around a particular body of knowledge, and significant disruption to that body of knowledge is never easy. Um, and there, so there's that tendency, and then on the other hand, you have the great kind of change agents of, of revolution that we've been talking about. And so people's reaction to this, at least in what we're seeing, is, 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 is trying to become more efficient, trying to become more reliant on data, whatever that means, in decision making. Um, and the, the, the challenges that, that interest, frankly, interest me personally the most are, are, are those where, um, we can try to bring some analytic tools um, to help us make sure that we're asking the right questions. Because that's, to me, data is not about telling us the answers. It's about making sure we're asking the right question. Thank you, Greg. But I'd like to call on uh, Salome Bentink, who is at the University of uh, Delft. Um, thank you for inviting me. It's very interesting to me. Um, uh, let me let me introduce myself. I study campus development and especially uh, places on campus and uh, uh, the way a physical uh, environment can facilitate face-to-face -face communication and create a sense of belonging. Um, so I'm, um, well, the campus of the future, that is really, um, somebody asked, uh, to this night, 
um, about what is the why should we go to campus? Why should we be why should we be there? Because we can every do, uh, we can do everything online. Um, and it is maybe true that for information transfer, for uh, uh, knowledge transfer, uh, you can very well do things online. But for knowledge development, it's still, uh, well, you could say more efficient to also uh, do things face to face. Um, because face to face communication is still uh, more efficient than the computer mediated communication. So it is in really important to be on campus, to be um, in the university building for students and for our faculty. Um, and those, I think those two groups, we should, we should make a difference between these two groups because students have other preferences than faculty. And what we see that is, especially in libraries, the, the books are out and the study places come in. And, um, and they are really, really very popular. The study places in the library in the Netherlands are more pop popular than uh, the study places in other university buildings. And you could ask it, why is that? And maybe the librarian has an answer to that. Um, but I think that the academic atmosphere, the intellectual agora that a library is, is still uh, a very important. Um, even if there are not, uh, not no, well, there are still books, but not that much. So um, students like to come to the study places, like to meet each other, chat each other, have this good coffee, which is very important indeed. So as we move forward, as the campuses and you know, the student body moves forward and things and places become more flexible and mobile and customizable, um, on the contrary, do you start to see things and places starting to lose their identities in their communities? Um, for example, um, you know, if degrees start to become more and more specialized, um, do we start to marginalize some people from each other that once were more of a whole? Sure. Um, you know, as I look at um, the mass customization economy, the so-called sharing or collaborative economy that's emerging around universities. Uh, in fact, um, there, it's a very social economy that is very much dependent upon communities of people working together. Um, and so uh, I think that the difference is, is that the communities are much more um, self-organizing than they are imposed. So the traditional higher ed model of a cohort of students who come into a degree program and move through the degree program and come out the other end, that idea may in fact be changing and may in someday become um, obsolete. But I think what we're seeing is the emergence of self-organizing uh, communities of people who are finding commonalities in the combinations of disciplinary knowledge that they're pursuing. Um, and uh, as well as we increasingly talk about the T-shaped education where um, the educated person of the future will have a depth of knowledge in a discipline and a breadth of understanding how it gets applied to a problem um, that we're starting to see um, interdisciplinary cohorts of students emerging so that the students you're working with and have a community with aren't all in your discipline. In fact, they may be people who are interested in the same questions you are from very different kinds of disciplines. And just one final point, you know, one of the things we don't like to talk about in higher education is through our disciplinary perspective, we have ghettoized ourselves, which is that we all are in intellectual ghettos. We spend our days with other people who are in our same discipline. And we put everybody of a single discipline in a single building and we keep them apart from other disciplines in the building next door. And that ghettoization of knowledge is a real problem because the world is not organized that way. And the problems that we face 
do not lend themselves to that ghettoization of knowledge. And so the communities of the future will still be there, but they will be very different from what we've known in the past. What a wonderful point. Uh, but Terry, uh, perhaps uh, the ghettoization by discipline is less uh, present at a smaller uh, institution? I, I I wish that were the case. Uh, we're having conversations now about uh, about revising our, our general education program, and uh, there are very creative faculty who are advocating for a a concept of a boundaryless boundaryless um, campus, and and much less, much more interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary, and and uh, then a group of opponents who say that that's a, a much less rigorous approach uh, to to teaching and learning, and are are there's really a a, a battle between. Uh, and a struggle between these perspectives. And uh, it's very discouraging because uh, what it means is we continue to delay and delay and delay. In the meantime, I don't see us adapting our curriculum to help our students thrive in the world. The, the world is changing as we debate these things. So I, I wish it were the case, Michael, that I, that we were small enough that we could be more embracing of uh, a cooperation and, and a, a liberating transdisciplinarity, but that's, uh, unfortunately, it's not the case. Uh, I'd like to call on uh, Stephen and uh, Gregory to comment on the difficulty of planning for this kind of fluid environment of expectations. I think the notion of uh, customization um, then speaks to the, the, the notion of intentional communities and um, communities of um, shared interest. Um, and, and I think the, um, the idea of flexibility um, and the ability to adjust dynamically over time um, to these intentional communities as they shift becomes the design challenge. Uh, um, and, and from a planner's perspective, um, creating the kind of spaces that can be more laboratory-like um, or studio-like, um, I think, is um, part of the solution where, um, you know, the space is asked to do whatever the space needs to do to allow a project or a program to shape itself. Um, the beauty of the virtual space is that it's very malleable um, and can be um, created in any number of ways. Um, to serve a project, and I think our physical space is going to need to respond in a similar way. Gregory? You have to let go of the plan. The plan is, is not as important as the planning. The plan's going to be wrong. The plan's going to be relevant shortly after it's completed. And so you have to really question the, the, the very fundamental products that come out of these kinds of exercises. Um, and unfortunately, that means you get to draw fewer red boxes, but, you know, that's okay. And what what you have to think about is what kinds of things are helpful to people um, in the future as some unanticipated circumstances arise that allow them to well, judge that new circumstance and then incorporate it into the, the web. Of, of, of an overall design. So, so for us in practice, that means that there, there are really three critical components to a, to a planning process. One still retains a lot of the traditional elements around a long-term vision, um, but, but that's really about sort of land use and infrastructure and, you know, large-scale investments of that kind. It's not about saying that, you know, 14 months 14 years from now, building X is going to go 27 feet from curb line Y. I mean, that's that's impossible. And on, on, on the other end of the spectrum, you have to focus attention on, on near-term priority projects that are dirty and messy and stakeholders have to buy into it. And you have to be very cognizant of available resources and making those allocation decisions. And you have to make some really tough choices, which is 
which is not easy at all. And then in between that, you need an ongoing decision-making process that has to be driven by principles. And those principles can't be all motherhood and apple pie. I'm I'm a fan of well, I'm a fan of motherhood. I'm not a huge fan of apple pie. Um, but but those are important. But you need you need real ways of judging um, a potential new opportunity. And those kinds of principles again have to be forged in the trenches. And you have to get people to buy in. And not everybody's going to be happy. Um, and that, by the way, is where I think data can be helpful because it can it can at least force people to agree on a consensual view of reality. Um, and and so that's, I, I think it's sort of a fundamental paradigm shift in the kinds of things that you're delivering. And to me, that doesn't denigrate or de-emphasize design. Um, it, 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 it just calls for design to be contextual and it calls for it to incorporate a bunch of things that maybe aren't traditionally taught in architecture school. I, I want to toss this to uh, somebody who is uh, buried in the center of that kind of design challenge now, the rework of the library uh, here at uh, Georgia Tech. How are, how are you and your colleagues thinking about that fluid future when you're building uh, in three dimensions? Yes, it's very much a part of our, our planning and our plan. Uh, is to create spaces that are what the architects have called long life loose fit. So building infrastructure which will last for 100 years, uh, but uh, programming spaces to shift rapidly. Um, and perhaps we uh, provide uh, tools. You know, the library is where you go to check out materials, books, but also Arduino boards and maybe um, a small saw and maybe a 3D printer as well uh, so that there's a workshop kind of atmosphere in some of these spaces. That being said, there are also spaces that are um, one might call sacred, places where you really want to create a sense of place. Um, that's one of the highest points on campus with a beautiful view of Atlanta uh, is uh, criminally underutilized because it's blocked off to students. It's the seventh floor of the library. We want to make that the inspirational reading room, uh, a place where you can take your laptop and engage with the digital universe of information, but also alone together. So 20 years on, when you're back on campus, you remember that moment when you looked out on the Atlanta skyline and had that idea for your startup. So it's a mix of things, you know, some flexibility, a lot of flexibility, but also not losing sight of these wonderful opportunities to create uh, a transcend, kind of transcendental experience on a very high floor. Yeah, but you're still building in uh, three-dimensional space, and you hope you've got a loose enough fit for that long term. I like to think that what the world needs is not really good gloves, but excellent mittens. What I would like to do is uh, ask for summary um, comments from our guests on the uh, the future of the campus. I, I think I think the future of the campus is bright. Um, I, I don't view uh, technology as an existential threat to faith-based higher education um, for many of the reasons that we've discussed tonight. Uh, on the learning side, we, 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 you know, active learning models are, are proving themselves out, and uh, and that to me needs a, a place-based component. And uh, and on the research side, uh, in many of our disciplines, the research, you know, you still need Bunsen burners, and 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 you you need those collaborative sparks that come from kind of interactions between folks. So the the, the challenges are are in some ways age old. They're political challenges. They're uh, about getting the resources where they can do the most good, not necessarily where the donor wants to put them, uh, or for that matter, where the state wants to put them. And and how you address those challenges is is complex and complicated and requires the good thinking of good people. Um, but you know, I I I I I'm one who embraces the role of um, the university in our public life and. Uh, uh, 
I, I don't understand how our public life could continue without that. So the goal should be to, our, to equip ourselves um, to make the best possible use of the resources that we can. And, uh, and I come back to thinking that that's more a political question than it is anything else. And uh, maybe that requires some political solutions. Um, but bold ideas, great leadership, uh, and a common sense of purpose are the way forward. Stephen. Um, very well said. Um, I, I'd like to add um, to the whole conversation the need to um, kind of embrace the spirit of um, experimentation in higher education. I think any time an environment is changing rapidly, um, old solutions are most likely to fail, and one needs to be oriented at finding new solutions. Um, the university as a laboratory um, is an essential element of what the future needs to um, afford. Um, and I think, um, you know, to learn from the virtual space in terms of how it reconfigures and adjusts and is dynamic um, is a lesson that we must adapt in our universities. Um, the notion of uh, mass customization, which has been so elegantly spoke to, um, I think is um, what the technology um, revolution is all about. Um, and our universities, as mediators of information, as knowledge, um, need to um, adjust quickly um, to this notion of um, a lifestyle or a, a life cycle of change that is increasingly short. Um, so, um, you know, I, I agree that place-based education will always be part of our cultural milieu, but, um, you know, I think um, as more and more opportunity to create um, embodied space and um, embodied learning, um, you know, the universities are becoming very um, stagnant, and, and um, I, I worry that many of the small publics are going to face real challenges in terms of survival an adjustment of their business model if there isn't a revolution in the way they think about change. Um, so, you know, I, I mean, I, I think the um, romantic notion of higher education as a place um, to go and experience the transformation in your life, although a wonderful concept, really needs to be um, challenged a bit by the notion of higher education as being a place to experiment and to transition in your life, in multiple times in your life, um, which, you know, is really a dramatically um, new context. Um, this notion of, um, you know, multiple careers, um, the notion of being a lifelong learner. Um, education has to become much more nimble and, and find an ability to adjust to the new realities. Thanks, Stephen. I mean, one of the things that seems to be lurking in, in the background of a lot of these conversations about, say, MOOCs or libraries is uh, copyright and the fact that copyright, particularly in the United States, may be uh, a little bit more advanced in Europe. Copyright is not keeping up with where universities currently are, where they're going, where they should be going. It's, um, it's a huge problem. Uh, and if you want to know just how much of a problem Georgia State University was sued uh, not too long ago by some publishers for what they called copyright infringement, but what every university does, and that's putting things on reserve. So um, it, it's something that, that uh, is of great concern to librarians, but also it should be of great concern to faculty and, uh, and university administrators uh, and, and certainly policymakers. So hopefully that's something that will be evolving, but uh, I'm not optimistic at this point. That I, I believe the campus that has a future will be a campus that is absolutely clear about its mission and focused on that mission. And I, I don't know that it's been, I think it's been said in this conversation so far, but I think there are, there is a lot of distraction on campuses away from the primary mission, which is teaching uh, students uh, and, um, and, and helping students learn. 
that and even research universities I know that are, are, are asking them the, uh, asking their faculty to care about and want to teach. Uh, I think that's part of the transformation that's happening. Not to say that we won't need research universities, but at the center of it is these masses of people that we need to help uh, learn. And uh, I think that's, that will be the campus of the future, the campus that really has a focus on that as its primary purpose. I have to take a minor issue with that as a, as a research person who runs a lab. Uh, I have a lot of graduate students, and I would argue there's an awful lot of learning that occurs in a lab that is, in fact, asynchronous uh, and just in time. So I might ar argue that a research lab is actually the future of the university. But well, at least some part of it. Some part of it. My okay. summary is, uh, to put in that little answer on the test, the future of the resilient campus is one of flexibility, malleability, and innovation. It is a flexible space that uses locale or place as a context for applying resource flows in support of information manipulation and community operation. That's my answer. Like everyone else, I've also thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. I'd like to go back to the idea of experimentation as well as the point about universities being caught between revolution and ossification. And it seems to me that one of the great opportunities is sitting right in front of us on each of our campuses. Uh, John Cotter from the Harvard Business School has talked quite a bit about the way in which change has to occur in corporations, which, like universities, are highly hierarchical and ossified systems. And he calls for a, what he calls a dual operating system to be put in place, which is that there needs to be conscious experimentation happening alongside the ossified structure. And as ideas uh, prove to be worthwhile, they, they begin to change the established structure. And in a higher education mode, the way I read Cotter's thinking is that uh, we all have um, campuses that are highly underutilized in the summer months. And I think higher education needs to see that as an enormous opportunity to, op to have a dual operating system where essentially there's a parallel university that is allowed to grow in the summer on campus where students get credit and faculty get paid, but they self-consciously experiment with virtually every rule in the ossified existing system so that uh, we challenge the idea of seat time, we challenge the idea of course credit, we challenge the idea of a standardized curriculum, we challenge virtually every aspect of our um, higher education model in order to uh, continue to uh, experiment. And um, so I think that uh, the importance of the campus in the future is that it will continue to operate in the nine months of the academic year in its uh, mass production mode for, for some time in the future, but that the, we need to sort of begin to develop a, a mass customization uh, set of experiments uh, in, in parallel with this and allow that to eventually change the ossified system that we're all struggling with. So that would be to me, one of the important roles of the campus is that it has this space, this time, and this staffing capacity that is horribly underutilized at the moment. And I think is where the future of the university will emerge. My closing thoughts have to do with the ability that we have now to make this room bigger. Here this evening we've had uh, about 45 people in the room in one way or another, and I think there is value in that uh, synchronous experience, even though we don't uh, share place or space at that point in time. But our experience with these environments uh, is increasingly uh, episodic. That is, it, um, it comes in uh, smaller, less sustained bursts of experience, uh, but that those environments are not less important, but in fact are more important. 
uh, given the fragmentary and fluid nature of our involvement with them. I had a conversation with an old friend the other day who talked about the importance of campuses, that the quality of those environments has a long-term value in what it teaches about the potential for environments to be places where people can meet, where people can communicate, where people can share ideas, where people can learn and grow. And returning, either physically or in memory, they know that the environment can, in fact, be better uh, and have the opportunity over their lifetimes to work on the creation of better environment. I want to thank everybody who's uh, taken time to be available today and share their thoughts with my students. Thanks to one and all.